But it turned out to that case in Chicago causing so much outrage. Four young black people seen on a Facebook Live video attacking a white teen with special needs. They now face kidnapping and hate crime charges. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest. This morning, authorities in Chicago calling that brutal attack broadcast live on Facebook a hate crime. <laughs> Investigators overnight charging these four suspects with felony hate crime, battery, and kidnapping charges. The actions in that video are reprehensible. That gut-wrenching video appears to show a bound and gagged 18-year-old white man kicked and beaten by four African-American attackers. It appears that he was in that physical position tied up in the corner for about four or five hours. The assailants hurling racial slurs at the victim, whom authorities say is mentally challenged, even referencing the president-elect. <laughs> Investigators releasing new details on how the attack unfolded. The victim, who knew one of the attackers and had plans to hang out with him New Year's Eve, ended up spending two days with him. When the suspect took him to a friend's house, investigators say it was there that a play fight escalated into a painful assault. We have the statements of the four of them. I mean, they admit that they were beating him. Um, uh, kicking him. The victim has been treated and released and is now back with his family. He's doing uh, well as, uh, as well as he could be at this time. This should never happen. And Facebook has since removed the video. The company in a statement says they have a team dedicated on call 24 7 to respond to cases like this one. Robin? Oh, horrible cases like this one. All right, thank you. All right, welcome to another session of Com Law Ethics and Diversity. And today we take a look into the whole notion of what is happening on social media as it relates to media ethics. I've showed you that video to segue into today's session because we're living in a social media era where everything goes on the different platforms that are available to citizen journalists as well as bona fide journalists who are working with established media houses. That incident you viewed happened just about six years ago, and it's because there are people, uh, many persons who are actually using, um, you know, cameras, they're using um, whatever is available to them to stream their atrocities, and in some cases it's working, um, I would say, uh, not necessarily in their favor. And so we will discuss how social media ethics really informs a lot of journalism practice has evolved over time in keeping with what we call social media ethics in journalism practice. Now, I hope that you have read your uh, case for today, whose Facebook page is it anyway, from the 8th edition, as well as the radio, television, um, and, and of course, the social media and blogging guidelines, as well as the potentially illegal social media policies that has been, uh, the policies that have been articulated by the Pointner organization. Now, to get into the case of Barrett Tyron, Tryon, rather, an Emmy Award-winning multimedia journalist um, who was caught in a controversy some years ago in 2012, this really gets to the heart of a journalist not necessarily enjoying the privileges of a private versus personal, I mean, public life. Um, for journalists, um, all of them will have Twitter handles. Um, most journalists will have Facebook accounts as well, just as much as private citizens do have um, private accounts, but you're pretty much a public figure as a journalist. And so what Tryon did at the time of this particular incident in 2012 was to post a link to a Los Angeles Times story on his personal Facebook page. And the question emerged, whose Facebook page is it? All right. Since it's past, we can say whose Facebook page was it? The particular story really focused on the parent company that owned the Colorado Spring Gazette, where Tryon was working at the time. And of course, the LA Times story that he carried on his Facebook page claimed that the parent company, Freedom Communications, was selling a number of newspapers, including the Gazette. Now, the implications of this particular issue that we're discussing in today's session has to do with the fact that Barrett received an email from his boss stating that he actually violated the newspaper's social media policy. You will recognize that as part of today's readings, 
there is a, a sort of a video, sort of the content, there's a video there that really, you know, illustrates the whole notion of whether a company should have a social media policy. And so if you're going to ever be working for um, a media organization or even an advertising organization or any particular media company, um, even if it's outside of a, I would say, traditional uh, media platform company, you've got to um, be aware of what their policies are in relation to what it is you can and cannot post. This is specifically as it relates to how companies are clamping down on their employees actually going out um, and what they say, telling tales, um, on, you, know, you know, letting people know what is happening on the job. Um, check to see whether a policy exists with relation to what you can actually um, divulge to the public and whether you are in violation. And so he was told that he was in violation of the social media policy, and then he was asked to remove the post and subsequently sent on leave. Now, for Freedom Communications, their handbook on confidentiality and proprietary rights um, really stated that, you know, no employee was supposed to. Each employee was prohibited from posting what they called disparaging or defamatory statements about a company or its business interests. And so you will see that defamatory and disparaging really has to do with those negative elements of a company. But he was not doing that. In fact, he was actually posting an issue that really first appeared in, on the, in, in the LA Times specifically. And so he was not guilty of posting anything that was disparaging or defamatory. They were just statements of fact. Um, as part of their own handbook, they also stated that one should avoid social media communications that might be misconstrued in a way that could damage the company's goodwill and business reputation, even indirectly, the policy in question. Now, Barrett argued in his own defense that he was acting within his rights under the First Amendment, um, freedom of information, um, the ability to let people know what is happening, as a journalist, the, the right to information, the link was actually posted on his personal account and not on the paper's account. And of course, the story came from the LA Times, which remains today a credible source. And so it's natural to be interested in something that directly affected him at that time in 2012. And so he posted the story about the possible buyout of the particular newspaper. Now, due to the attention that his suspension received, he was offered his job back, but he refused the job, and so he left. He quit. And some of the people who actually supported him in the controversy argued that the policy violated the National Labor Relations Act. Again, it's very important to understand your rights within the realm of working for a company that prohibits any particular types of posting, especially if that posting or that particular issue that you're actually letting the public know about is not disparaging got to be very aware of how your rights may be infringed upon in the context of what Barrett actually faced back then. Now, the acts were deemed to be um, unlawful based on the following policies. Instruction not to reveal non-public company information on any public site, and of course, um, avoid harming the image and integrity of the company. The National Labor Relations Act speaks specifically to these particular types of infringements, and these were not necessarily um, revealed to have occurred in, 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 in the context or in the case of Barrett. Um, the National Labor Relations Act also um, really dictates that someone does not you know, express public opinions about the workplace, work satisfaction or dissatisfaction or wages, hours or work conditions. In their particular mind, they're saying that really you should be able to express any grievance as it relates to your dissatisfaction with the company, all right? For them, these particular um, types of laws or regulations were seen as draconian. They were seen as really unlawful um, where Barrett's case was concerned and anybody else who would have found themselves in a similar fate, so to speak. So for them, he was not harming the image and the integrity of the company. Now, in Tryon's defense, no single social media policy was broken. He was merely reposting. There was no opinion because he was posting something that originally came from the LA Times. It's like you saw a story or you see a story coming to your feed and you're basically reposting it on your Facebook page or your Instagram or your Twitter, all right? And of course, 
no opinion was included, uh, followed by the fact that he cautioned awareness. He was cautioned about the awareness of social media policies. Now, what does the RTDNA social media and blogging guidelines say about all that is happening right now that is occurring on social media? How should persons who are working on social media be guided? Now, this goes for any of you who will be thinking through the whole notion of working on social media platforms. If you are developing your ethical code for that final assignment, this may be of interest to you in terms of what it says down the line. Truth and fairness really stands out in this particular guideline, the list of guidelines. It says here that social media comments and postings should meet the same standards of fairness, accuracy, and attribution that you apply to your own ear or digital platform. In a nutshell, this basically says that you should always strive for truth, accuracy, and fairness wherever you are, whether you are usually online, live, or you're, you're basically using your platform to post, all right? Um, so if somebody's coming with a live feed, there should be truthfulness and fairness and accuracy. If there's a blog, there should also be truthfulness and fairness and accuracy. And so for the full guidelines, please see this particular link at the bottom here. And it's also available in D2L for you to actually access. Now, another guideline to note is that when using content from blogs or social media, we should really be asking critical questions such as, what is the source of the video or photograph? Who wrote the comment and what was the motivation for posting it? So before you repost, you're checking to see whether there is authenticity and whether the subject, the source where the particular video photograph is coming from, they are a bona fide journalist. In some cases, you may have some citizen journalists who may be up to no good. They may, they may might not have used um, very legal means to get the information. In some cases, the content may lead to lawsuits um, as it relates to defamation of character. So it's very important if you're working you know, on, on blogs or social media sites that you um, just really check to see where the, the source is um, in terms of the video or the photograph, rather than just post without fact checking or double checking to see exactly what particular um, background the person has before you post that particular content. The second um, issue or uh, I would say consideration to note is question of whether the source has the legal right to the material posted. We spoke a couple of weeks ago about this whole notion of copyright infringements. And so you want to make sure that you're not infringing in any way, shape, or form in the context of reposting something that was not authorized to be used when it comes to the copyright infringement regulations that exist. Did the person take the video, um, take the photograph, or capture the video, or did they take it down from a particular site? So the origins, this, you know, it, it, this has to be very, very clear in terms of the source and the legal right to use that particular, um, I would say, content. Then we come to issues of accountability and transparency, which really is at the heart and cuts to the heart of what happens on social media platforms. You should not write anonymously or use an avatar or a username that cloaks your real identity on newsroom or personal websites. Once a journalist, always a journalist. You don't have a private life and a public life. If you are a journalist and people see you as a source that is authentic, a, a trusted source, so to speak, then you've got to maintain that trust throughout um, those particular platforms that you're using so that you remain that particular credible individual in the eyes of the public that you're serving. Um, in, in saying that, I'm saying this to say that you are responsible for every single thing you say as someone who's working um, across online platforms. And so commenting or blogging anonymously really compromises this particular core principle of accountability and transparency. You've got to maintain one single persona, not somebody by day and another person by night when it comes to really maintaining that transparency and accountability to the people that you're serving. And then another point to note is to be especially careful when you're writing, tweeting, or blogging about the topic that you or your newsroom covers. This means that editorializing is not an acceptable practice. 
because this brings in bias or your personal feelings. So there is the need to be dispassionate about whatever you're writing um, in the context of the news because it has to be purely objective based on your sourcing and of course, leaving the public to come to their own conclusion. That there is the essence of really being very careful and blogging about something that your newsroom is actually covering from a dispassionate perspective. Now we come to some general questions. And if we were face to face, I would be asking you these same questions. But these are questions I'd like you to consider for this particular module. What do you think about you know, Tryon's case? What are the competing loyalties here? We spoke a few weeks ago about, you know, uh, you know, journalists having competing loyalties, loyalties to their job, to their profession, to their editors, to the people. What do you think would have transpired in his mind as he posted that particular story? Whose actions do you consider to be more ethically defensible? Barrett or his boss who decided to send him home, teach him a lesson or a moment? From a broader perspective, do you think that social media companies try to control the personal social media postings of their employees? Absolutely, because you're hired and you're fired sometimes on the basis of what you post there on social media. And we've seen this happening over time in recent times, in recent months, weeks, days, um, when it comes to people having privacy and posting something that they might be aggrieved over or something that might have occurred even in their personal lives and they're called into question in terms of how is it that you're actually representing us and you're posting something that appears to be disparaging. And this brings me to the next question. Should companies post their policies online or should employees post their policies online for the public to see? All right. So Barrett Tryon said that he had a First Amendment right to publish. Now, do you think that it's ethical in terms of his own practice based on his claim to that particular right? And finally, does the First Amendment trump professional loyalty in this particular case? Should he have been given the full right to exercise his First Amendment right rather than his professional loyalty to those persons that he is actually working for, the media company? Now, these are all the questions I have for you, but I'd like you to think through these particular questions here as you consider the case for today in terms of social media ethics and how it is that online media platforms that we're seeing now emerging across conglomerates and those particular mergers and acquisitions, how are they playing out for the journalists? Is there a public self and a private life or should the journalists be made to really understand that there is no particular distinction and that there's one persona that should be there in the public?